This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 26. Sean and I are super excited, does not capture it. Very, 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 very excited to be here with Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, who is the author of many books. Um, the most current one is Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots? Flaming Challenges to Masculinity, Objectification, and the Desire to Conform, which came out on Valentine's Day of this year. And I'm going to say a little bit about Matilda's bio, and then we're going to go into some questions around several of the books that you've written. And the one that I know the best is Nobody Passes. I've read that several times, and we've actually talked about that book on a couple um, different podcast episodes. So Matilda is a writer, editor, activist, artist, filmmaker, critic, and troublemaker. Most recently, she is the editor of Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots, Flaming Challenges to Masculinity, Objectification, and the Desire to Conform, released on Valentine's Day of this year. Matilda is the author of two novels, So Many Ways to Sleep Badly and Pulling Taffy. So Many Ways to Sleep Badly came out in 2008 and Pulling Taffy in 2003. She is the editor of four additional nonfiction anthologies, Nobody Passes, Rejecting the Rules of Gender and Conformity, that came out in 2007. That's Revolting, Queer Strategies for Resisting Assimilation. Looks like it came out in 2004 and then an update in 2008. Dangerous Families, Queer Writing on Surviving, which came out in 2004, and Tricks and Treats, Sex Workers Write About Their Clients. Oh, we just did an episode on sex work, which also now appear in Italian, which came out in 2007. So you have quite an extensive list of books that you've worked on. I haven't read them all and I want to read more. So the main book that we wanted to focus on today was one, we just heard you do a reading at Elliott Bay Books in Seattle, and that is the Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots? And so we'll hear from you a little bit about that and then also talk some of, about some of your other work. The Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots is the, the latest book. I see that you brought it and hopefully you will pick a few entries to read for us and maybe talk a little bit more in depth around some of the chapters that you like or feel connected to in some some way sure well i guess i mean for me you know every time i edit an anthology i really look for the pieces that surprise me you know so i put out a, an idea into the world and so in this case you know the book all my anthologies they come from a really personal place and so in a way why are faggots so afraid of faggots i see it as kind of like part of a trio of books you know sort of starting with that's revolting and that's revolting was sort of an injection of criticality and explosive possibility into the sort of mainstream morass, you know, of the assimilationist nightmare, you know, of, uh, you know, saying things like marriage and military and uh, ordination to the priesthood and hate crimes legislation, you know, that should be the only things that queers care about. And I wanted to sort of find a way to like express the sort of radical queer visions that were inspiring to me in terms of activism and in terms of community building and chosen family and to sort of I interject into that, you know, the, the dead end of the sort of mainstream media debate between Christian fundamentalists and gay assimilation. And then Nobody Passes came about from, you know, seeing passing become kind of valorized, you know, in the queer, trans, gender, queer, you know, so cultures that I was involved in. I wanted to sort of examine passing as a means through which assimilation sometimes takes place and is allowed to remain invisible, you know. And so I wanted to talk about passing across all different lines, you know, not just passing into dominant cultures like passing as straight or male or white, but also, you know, passing in subcultures and cultures of resistance. So, you know, what does it mean to pass as genderqueer? Or what does it mean to pass as anti-capitalist? Um, and then, so why are faggots so afraid of faggots? In a way, is the, it's the most specific of the books, but it's bringing the analysis, you know, of the other two books into play in a more specific question of what has given rise to the personal nightmares now intrinsic to gay sexual and social cultures. So for me, it, it comes from, you know, I feel really inspired by trans and genderqueer and gender defiant cultures that I'm a part of, but then sexually I exist, you know, in gay male worlds that basically mimic all the grossest aspects of straight normalcy without even questioning, you know, and whether that be 
the sort of mainstream gay establishment agenda of, you know, marriage and, and military and white picket fence and, you know, uh, some adopted kids and maybe a terrier or two. Whether it's, <laughs> whether it's that side or the other side of the sort of hyper-objectified, brutal, I'm just going to get what I can take and then throw away the rest culture of, of gay cruising, especially, you know, on the internet and and the way um, in which sort of stereotypical straight masculinity is valorized in gay male culture almost more than it is in any other culture. So I guess for me, you know, in putting the book together, I was looking for the pieces that sort of surprised me. And, you know, I really wanted pieces that were really complicated in their analysis, but coming in from a really informal, friendly, intimate way. For me, what I wanted to do with the book is to instigate a conversation that's not happening, you know, whether that be about, you know, sexual safety and risk taking, or whether that be about racism in, you know, gay male culture, or whether that be about body fascism, or about aging, or about trans masculinity, or about femininity, or, or demonization of queeniness, or a rejection of, of the sort of original uh, values of gay liberation. You know? And also the pieces, you know, where they start in one place and then just when you think you're you're getting comfortable and you know where it's going, they go somewhere else. So for example, there's a piece by Debanuj Dasgupta. His piece is called Transnationally Femme, Notes on Neoliberal Economic Regimes, Security States, and <laughs> My Life as a Brown Immigrant Fag, you know? And so he talks about growing up in Calcutta, India, and finding himself in sort of like a globe-trotting, you know, upwardly mobile, English-educated culture of gay men who like really look down at Kotis, who are feminine queens, you know, uh, third sex, third gender, who would hang out in the parks and, you know, were not English-educated, you know. And then he finds himself in a cruising park, you know, doing safer sex outreach being harassed by the cops, and it's the Cotis who come to his defense. You know, he doesn't know what to do, and they scare the cops away. And then that leads him to question, well, who are my allies, you know? And then so it starts there, and then it continues with him going to uh, school in Ohio, and, Ohio. <laughs> and then meeting this, you know, sort of uh, Germanic, guy, you know, white guy in a bathroom and ending up in a master-slave relationship where he plays the docile Asian slave to the white, you know, master. And, and then examining the sort of obvious limitations. Well, actually the sexual satisfaction, but then the fact that the guy who ends up dating won't even speak to him in public, more or less. And then from there, it goes into talking about post 9-11 New York and the ways in which queer immigrants of color find each other and rely on each other in this new realm of, well, not a new realm, but an intensified realm yeah. of, of racist scapegoating. And so in that sense, he sort of talks about the ways in which both straight and gay cultures are not supporting the sort of mutual self-determination and that's necessary for people to actually find one another and, and express themselves in uh, survival at first, but then also, you know, joy and festivity. And so that's an example of like one piece, you know, that goes in a lot of different directions. The final piece in the book by Kristen Stokler sort of talks about, starts by talking about the valorization of masculinity in drag king cultures. Mm -hmm. And she sort of examines, well, here's a culture based on performativity, where an idea of like real masculinity, whatever that is, is the thing that's supposedly like, oh, you have to be real you know to be and and where femininity or especially queeny drag kings are considered kind of a little bit substandard and it starts there and then it sort of ends up talking about gender policing in a gay bar in minneapolis where they end up having someone at the door of the men's bathroom to only allow the people with m on their on their license in to use the men's bathroom and then it sort of ends with a, a drag king performance where at the end the performer sort of stripped down, you know, to nothing but, actually I think completely naked at the end, and sort of the liberatory potential of a kind of faggotry that is chosen, uh, negotiated, and performed. So those, for example, those are a couple of the pieces, you know, that gives a sense, you know, there's also pieces about prison, there's there's a lot, several pieces about HIV prevention and about sex lives that don't fit into 
either safe or unsafe. There are several pieces about barebacking and that both examine the, the, the lore of it and also the trap you know, and pieces about, you know, about drugs, about childhood, about, there's a piece uh, by Harris Kornstein where he talks about growing up with three kids at school, they all became theater queens or, or in, in high school, they were all closeted though, you know, they, so they were closeted theater queens. Um, and then the ways in which, you know, their relationship over time, you know, shifts, they eventually, uh, at first, you know, it's one by one, they come out over several years. And Gina DeVries has an interesting piece where she talks about growing up in San Francisco as a, a young queer kid and, uh, you know, like 12, 13, and finding uh, like queenie fags, like being her role models <laughs> and the ones that taught her, you know, how to take care of herself and how to, you know, express herself on the street and, and to be flamboyant and invulnerable and and vulnerable, like all, all of those things. Yeah, and then there's, you know, there's a, a piece by Nick Clarkson called Penis is Important for That, where he talks about romancing this uh, this leather fag who's, who's twice his age. And then when they get down to the, to the point of getting ready to hook up and him disclosing that he's trans, and then the guy not being able to, you know, conceptualize mm -hmm. any kind of, you know, sexual interaction. Oh, and there's a lot about internet cruising and the sort of, hierarchies, you know, the ways in which, you know, racism and fat phobia and a deification of masculinity, you know, are so glorified, you know, the ways in which things like no femmes or fatties or masculine only, straight acting, straight appearing, mm -hmm. HIV negative, where these become requirements, you know, or where saying something like no blacks or Asians is just considered, oh, that's just a standard thing, like, you know, at the end of a third of every post or something. And so a couple pieces that sort of want to examine in a more complicated way, it's like, how do we get to a point where the response, the standard response to any kind of critique of that is, is oh, well, sorry, man, you know, it's just a preference, you know, or something. Yeah, it's, and it's not the inherent racism. Exactly. And it's like, how do we, <laughs> how are we able to have a more, because I think that's one of the, one of the problems with gay male culture, it's become a refuge in a way mm -hmm. for especially misogyny, but racism and fat phobia and classism and transphobia, like it's become this refuge in a way. And it's like hyper-capitalist. Well, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like to the core, almost in a way defines, you know, consumer culture in a certain yeah. way. So do you have a favorite story that you might want to read an excerpt from? Like, I'm just, I can't wait to read this book. Oh, what am I? I was like, turning you on the spot. Oh, like, actually out of all the local And books. I just want to know your, I want to know your favorite one. I guess I, I kind of want to know like which, maybe which one resonated with you the most. And maybe in that you can tell us a little bit about how, like your gender. We always ask people when they come on gender cast to talk a little bit about their gender identity and just a tiny bit about their narrative or whatever you're comfortable sharing. But I'm also just curious if you have a favorite mm -hmm. story in Faggot. Well, I don't think I ever really have a favorite <laughs> in one of my anthologies. I think one of the things for me about doing an anthology is... is well done! <laughs> For me, it's like I want to bring together the widest possible range of pieces that are, are going to engage with the ideas, you know, that I'm putting out in the world, but also challenge me, you know, and, and challenge everyone. And also I want to bring together an intimate conversation that I feel like is not happening, you know, definitely not happening in gay male cultures. And, you know, in some ways it does happen in trans and genderqueer cultures, but not enough. You know, and so for me, that's the real important part, you know, is the sort of conversation. And in terms of in terms of my gender identity, you know, I identify as a gender queer faggot and a queen on the trans continuum, you know, in some sort of, you know, gender bending, gender blurred, gender messed up, you know, sort of <laughs> a place, right? You know, I like that gender and, messed up. <laughs> uh, and hopefully always shifting and questioning, you know, at some point. I think at the point where, where questioning stops, like, I feel like that's in any, in any realm, you know, I feel like that's where things start to get violent in a certain way, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that's 
one of the things that I want to question with this is the ways in which in sort of gay male cultures, questioning is not allowed, you know, whether that be in a sexual realm where you're supposed to just grab what you can take. And if, if someone doesn't want it, they just push you away, you know, type of thing. And it's like, oh, what happened to like, are you into this? <laughs> <laughs> like that's considered, you know, I think in most like gay male realms, it's like to say, are you into this is considered like tacky or something. It's like, you're just supposed to be like, I don't want it or something, you know? And, but I guess I could, I could read my piece in the book if you'd like, you know, yeah. that will give you a little bit of my history yeah. in a certain sense. Generations. I met truly outrageous Chrissy Contagious just before the March on Washington in 1993. The biggest ever of its kind, a million white gays in white t-shirts applying for community spirit credit cards but at least that meant the freaks. We found each other and fast. Chrissy and I met in DuPont Circle because she liked my hair. And then later that night, I saw her dancing naked in a tree and screaming, girl! I didn't realize she was screaming at me until she came down with eyes bulging from ecstasy. <laughs> and took my hands and said, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> We're sisters. Chrissy loved to tell stories. So it made sense that other people love to tell her stories too. Like when she stole some tricks car in Seattle and decided to drive cross country. I can't remember if she was trying to get back to Florida where she was from or to some club in New York that didn't exist anymore. But anyway, she ended up crashing into a cop car, spent time in jail in Wyoming, but then somehow she was back in Seattle where she became the manager of the poshest boutique hotel in town. This was weeks or years later, but it all ended when she decided to throw a party and serve up all the liquor bottles earmarked for the mini refrigerators. Or, Maybe that's when she stole the tricks car. You know how these stories work. With Chrissy, there was usually someone kicking her out or locking her up, but then she was back at the bar and all the other legendary messes would giggle knowingly or snicker and keep on drinking and doing bumps because at least they hadn't ended up in jail in Wyoming. We were both crazy queens who spent too much time in worlds of clubs and drugs. We both sold sex for a living and moved from place to place in search of something we would never find. We both turned tricks for way too long until it made it, us distant in ways we hadn't expected. We believed in runway and reading and rage and rapture. But I don't mean to suggest that we were similar. Even when we first met in D.C. at the very end of our teenage years, I was there to protest and she was there to party. I'd returned to the horrible place where I'd grown up and she had so much fun that she moved there. We were looking for different things, but we were always looking. I remember the first time Chrissy stopped doing drugs. I guess it was soon after I first stopped doing drugs, now that I think about it. But I didn't think about it then. Chrissy started going to the gym and drinking protein shakes to bulk up, and she bought blue contact lenses to cover her deep brown eyes, and she tried to imitate some kind of upscale preppy look that before I'd always thought she was making fun of. But the worst part was that she didn't want anyone to call her a girl anymore. I remember when Chrissy first came to San Francisco, maybe a year after the march, and she was working big fake eyelashes and some store designed club outfit. And she took a look around at how people were reacting to her and said, girl, I need to change out of this. And I said, honey, don't ever let them make you change. I remember that moment because Chrissy told the story over and over and I loved her for it. And also, I loved her. There was never anything balanced about our relationship. I knew she was completely unreliable and so I never relied on her. 
She always trusted people who I thought were repulsive. Still, I respected her because she could let everything go over and over again in hopes of finding what she wanted. She never did, but neither have I. One time after drugs were gone from my life, but before it felt that way, Chrissy came to my house with gray skin and black knuckles. Fresh from the hospital and another abscess she called a spider bite. Sipping dust off from the straw that came with the can. Girl, I got cab vouchers. That's not a spider bite, I said. So she wiggled her tongue and asked if she could shoot up in the bathroom. Me first, I said, and we took a cab to a restaurant. Outside, she started shivering. And when I took her hand in my hand, or... Really, the mitten covering my hand. She said something about how her head hurt so much. She was sick of it all. She was angry that everyone was always letting her down. That's when we were really sisters. The last time I talked to Chrissy, she had just listened to me on an NPR program where I was telling the world that the gay marriage agenda was draining resources from everything that mattered. Chrissy was so annoyed at the announcer for calling me she. We call each other she all the time, Chrissy said, but that's because we're camping. <laughs> I couldn't believe that announcer. It was so disrespectful. I never understood how Chrissy could live in worlds filled with freaks and fruits and perverts and whores for so long, but still, she wanted to be normal. Sure, she could pull stunts that made everyone else look tame or prudish, but only on drugs. A few years ago, Chrissy went back to Florida to get away from Crystal, and I became someone she would call late at night when she'd been drinking for 12 hours the way she'd been drinking for 20 years almost. And even though she mostly stopped the rest of the drugs, there was always a cocktail waiting. She'd demand updates on the most notoriously obnoxious people in San Francisco and always acted surprised that I avoided them. Sure, a few of them had once been my friends, but the rest I'd barely even spoken to. Then she'd go to the kitchen for more ice, get back in bed with her cocktail, and start yelling at the TV. A play-by-play -play commentary on Hillary Clinton, or Heath Ledger, or the latest dildo infomercial. She loved Hillary and Heath, and was somehow scandalized that dildos were for sale on TV. But sometimes, she would surprise me with a drunken insight. Obama came on one night, and Chrissy started screaming, What are you selling me? Just tell me what you're selling me! Maybe you figured out that Chrissy's dead. Her heart stopped. That's what they said. Later, they said it was because of huffing, but I'm sure that's not the whole story. I wonder what Chrissy would yell at the TV during the sudden flash of news stories about an epidemic of queer teen suicides. An epidemic, we all know, has been going on for generations. I'm wondering about those of us who do survive. For how long? <laughs> Thank you for reading that. Absolutely. Yes, I um, I feel so lucky because I got to hear you read that at Elliott Bay as well. I want to ask a bunch of questions about Chrissy, but I know that that's not on the agenda. I was also there at the Elliott Bay reading, so this is the second time I've heard that, and it still is super powerful. It's kind of like it starts it starts off really funny, and in the sense of you know the party situation and the awesome tree scenario that you you know you paint this great picture of this like awesome fun time, and then it gets into this heavy heavy space and yeah i'm just sitting here actually feeling that again <laughs> that story actually dovetails nicely with our next question and sort of talking about mainstream gay norms and i know that you talked about that a little bit when you were talking about some of the different chapters but i feel like in chrissy's story like i was 
sensing a lot of that, she was sort of trying to conform to some of the norms that were out, like really trying to put on different identities and, and then changing her outfit in San Francisco, wanting to change her outfit because people were looking at her. And just this whole idea of conformity, not within the context of mainstream gay norms and heteronormativity and recreation of norms that we get from like hetero mainstream, mainstream culture. And I think of a lot like mainstream media. And I mean, part of why we do this podcast is to have and highlight people that are doing things outside of that and not just what the mainstream media would would choose to show. So I guess just in terms of talking about norms and challenging them and then just the pressure to sort of bend to, to the norms that are out there and not just around gay culture, but all kinds of different aspects of culture like white white culture and you had talked earlier about looking at, at class privilege and so you know, class culture, however you would say that, and ability. I think that's something that often gets left out in the conversation. And there's like no, you don't see any analysis around that barely in, in sort of mainstream media and mainstream culture, whether it's a physical ability or mental or emotional, I'm rambling on, but kind of talking about norms and how we challenge them and maybe relating that back to Chrissy if you want. Say as much <laughs> as you want. I want to hear all about it. <laughs> I think, what you know, what was interesting to me and sort of tragic about Chrissy was that here was this flamboyant creature, you know, who really, you know, was sort of always on the edge of, you know, falling off. But at the same time, you know, I think she really wanted to be, you know, normal by the definitions of mainstream, definitely mainstream gay worlds. I don't know that she wanted to be straight, you know, but I, although she would never have been capable of that, you know what I mean? And, you know, she was like a tweaker for like 15 years, you know, and, and she would put on these like rumpled like sport coats or something. I always thought it was like a joke, you know what I mean? But then what I learned, you know, later on was like, oh, she was actually trying to pass, you know? And it's like, to me, in a way, that's the ultimate tragedy of passing is that people who are actually have figured out alternatives have not sometimes have not figured out that they are alternative and so and that's the way you know sort of passing gets under a skin and that's in every in every realm you know whether that be race or class or gender or sexuality or ability or you know nationality or anything you know whether it's like an exercise trend or you know a spiritual gimmick or you know a marketing trend mm -hmm. in gay and queer cultures i think it's become particularly valorized like you know sort of the mainstream gay agenda you know it is so much about straight privilege mm -hmm. you know it's straight privilege at any cost you know and so that's how we see you know marriage and military and adoption and child rearing and hate crimes legislation and priesthood and gentrification and consumerism, those are pretty much the only things on the mainstream gay agenda. And a lot of the times it's just marriage and military and the other ones are kind of in parentheses. You know, and it's tragic to me, you know, that a culture that, you know, emerged because, you know, gay people couldn't express themselves openly and, and couldn't find places to meet one another and has now become in, in many ways more limited, I think, than certainly than some straight cultures. That gay neighborhoods have become, you know, places where homeless queers are arrested because they get in the way of happy hour, you know, and where trans women are arrested because they're getting in the way of property values. Where people with AIDS are evicted and people with disabilities so that gay people can get more for their property when they sell it. The sort of wealthy white Gaylandia, you know, the kind of like image of the of the wealthy white gay consumer is unfortunately an image that a lot of people who are not wealthy white gay consumers buy into. For me, you know, my work is always about finding and creating alternatives. And it's in particular, you know, in that realm, alternatives to the sort of status quo normalcy, you know, and I, the question for me with passing, you know, is, is like who who is left out? You know, there's always someone left out. When someone's passing, someone's failing, right? It's It sounds like a definition of the dictionary or something, but but it's, uh, it's, binary. it's like, how do we create space for everyone. I will almost want to say, so how do we create space on the margins? And you know, I think, so that's the question with think mainstream gay, and I'm using the word gay, but you know, now it's called LGBT, but it really means gay, you know? And the politics 
that are all about privilege rather than about who's being excluded. So it's like, you know, we don't see our seniors talked about or queer youth or queers of color or trans people or people with disabilities, immigrants. Everyone's kind of, who's marginalized is kind of pushed further to the margins. It's like, let's get rid of those people so we can present this like smiling, happy, like hyper patriot kind of image. And I think- It's the just like you. Exactly, the we're just like you kind of mentality. And I think, you know, for me, that's the real violence of assimilation. People will sometimes articulate, they'll ask me this question, well, you know, what if someone does want to get married? Or what if someone does want to join the military? Like, shouldn't they have that option? And I, I think for me, I want to create more options for, for people, not fewer. So joining the military, you know, going abroad and killing people and getting away with it, no one should have the right to do that. No one. You know, it's not, it's not something... I mean, yes, I'm aware that sometimes it's the only way people can get out of abusive families or get out of dead end towns, but that's tragic. We need to change that. You know, that's what we need to change. We don't need to make it, it possible for more people to be stuck in the military, you know, like going abroad and like bombing people for no reason, you know, and holding hands with a rainbow flag in Iraq. You know, I mean, what could be more disgusting? You know, it's just like, and hypocritical and violent that I think it's important to talk about the actual palpable violence, you know, and of assimilation. And I think that's how I phrase the sort of about directly about sort of the violence of assimilation, you know, and, you know, the ways in which anyone who can't fit into. And I think idea of where does gay culture become more hideously, you know, normative, in particular way, the hyper patriotic you know, we're just like you, vision of gay normalcy, whether that be like the sort of steroid pumped, you know, gym queen. I mean, they would, they would of course not identify mm -hmm. as a queen, no. but, <laughs> uh, or as a friend of mine in Provincetown would call them titty queens, which I thought was a good way to, <laughs> uh, but um, to flip it, you know, in a certain <laughs> sense, the sort of, you know, the violence that, that lies beneath that kind of mask. You know, and whether that mask is the sort of sweatshop produced, you know, nylon rainbow flag or whether that mask is Ellen DeGeneres, you know, or whether that mask is hate crimes. I mean, hate crimes legislation is a really interesting one because on the surface, if we have to talk about something that all queers have in common, you know, a certain way that something, you know, because I think there's fewer and fewer things that we all have in common. But one thing I do think we have in common is the need to fight like structural homophobia and transphobia, you know, and, but the way the mainstream gay movement wants to do it is with hate crimes legislation. So what does hate crimes legislation do? It just says that if, if someone murders a trans woman because she's like on the street, you know, walking home, then maybe that person will be put to death. <laughs> what does that do for like trans women who are walking on the street or any person, you know, who is expressing a gender that is not, you know, societally sanctioned, you know, more harm. exactly. It's more harm and it's more resources in a criminal legal system that is racist, that is classist, that is misogynist, that is transphobic, that is homophobic, you know, to the core. It's not, it's not like it happens to be those things. You cannot take those things away from our criminal justice system. It is what they are based on. That's what I, you know, and that's the other angle that people say, well, let's train cops, you know, to not be homophobic. It's like, let's train cops to not be cops. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, let's and get them guards. out of the <laughs> and prison guards and, you know, the whole thing. And it's that. So to me, in a way, that's some ways that that embodies the kind of hypocrisy of, of the gay movement, of this drive for privilege at any cost. It's, you know, it's about policing the borders, literally. The borders of gay identity, the borders of gay neighborhoods, you know, the borders of who's allowed in bed, in bed with you, mm -hmm. you know, the borders of who you're going to even allow on your chat screen to even be seeing their photograph. All about policing that. And in the same way, putting more hands in an already, you know, vicious, hideous structural system and that not just the legal system but also the nuclear family also organized religion you know it's like gay liberation you know it started it was like end the church you know end the state fight for an end to u.s militarism you know an end to policing of gay bars and, and control and autonomy you know for for queer bodies and lives and all of that is lost you know, I, I mean, it's, it's people say what happened to gay liberation? Well, it failed, you know what I mean? And I think in some ways it made it more possible for straight people to be more fluid with their gender and sexual and social identities. It definitely created cultures of resistance that I think still exist today, but in the larger structural sense, 
there is, you know, it didn't happen. You know what I mean? The, there's no liberation in buying a new pair of Gucci stilettos, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, a rainbow Hummer, you know, or whatever the hottest, you know, the, the hottest <laughs> cocktail of the moment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so that's the dead end of assimilation, you know, because what does assimilation mean in the end? If assimilation is completely successful, it's cultural erasure, you know, mm -hmm. and if that's the goal of the, you know, mainstream LGBT movement, then let's just stop now. You know what I mean? Like, you know, let's. I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> I was just, I, I had written down earlier when we were talking, when you were reading or talking about one of the um, entries in uh, Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots around the person in India that found allyship with actually the Kotis, um, who were kind of, you know, the lower class, less, less accepted gender, gender expression and they were basically chastised both by the gay community that had an education that spoke English, uh, but the allyship, right, the actual coming to the person's aid was by the group that was further, like, was further marginalized, and that was who the person felt, found safety with and felt allyship with, and I think that that's talking about all of these things. I mean, we've talked about, God, we've done a lot of episodes. We've talked about privilege. We've talked about how we got here in, in regards to feminism and what that looks like for our community as far as transphobia. And I just think about all of these things about when when we're traumatized or harmed as a community or an individual, one of the ways we feel safe or possibly could feel safe is to then be the harmer or the person that's going to continue to do that. And if I look at gay liberation or like going from the Harvey Milk, like we're here, we're queer to, hey, we're here and we're just like you, please sponsor our new, you know, like, Corporate yeah, right. Can you please, <laughs> Budweiser, would you, would you gladly donate some money to this awesome parade that we're going to do where we just drink too much? You know, like, it's really interesting to see how 30 years has produced this mass movement towards, hey, we're just like you and no longer allowed for different different ways, different family structures or different, different ways to engage in, you know, our sexual relationships or our gender expression or how we move through this world. I just think it's really interesting that we've kind of just perpetuated and repeated the cycle, which I feel is not a new thing to talk about. But at the same time, we've done it at the cost of almost isolating ourselves further by having to police so hard that we really don't have any real solidarity with our community any longer, unless we can play by all of the rules and be as rigid as possible so that we are those valued groups. Yeah, I feel also like people thinking that like with the military, like repealing don't ask, don't tell is somehow going to get us like more of something. But it's often like I see this a lot and it's even with like the chat rooms where you said no blacks or no Asians, like it's like this surface thing and it's like no one's looking at the root fundamental issue of what's actually going on and like how we're causing harm to each other as a culture. It's like, no, 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 you don't want to put energy towards repealing don't ask, don't tell. You want to put energy towards abolishing the military altogether. And like, why do we have war? Like, let's ask the important questions at the root. We recently had, you probably heard about this, our LGBT commission sponsored by the city of Seattle Race and Social Justice Initiative had an event that they were going to do that was the stand with us folks were coming in, the pro-Israeli. They've kind of co-opted the gay agenda to come in and we wound up a, a group of people went and talked to the commission and we got it canceled and you know we put the most of people experiencing the most oppression front and center and and gave them airtime to like say their case and it actually went like really well and then the lashback coming from the community just around we didn't have a conversation and like the it was just interesting watching like the predominantly like white male and white more lesbian and gay cisgendered people sort of at the front of like ag or agencies and organizations locally basically coming forward and the way that they talked about like how the event got canceled and because of it getting canceled we like didn't put ourselves out there for a dialogue but completely missing the fundamental issue that it's like completely racist and like what pinkwashing is and like denying its whole existence when we actually like if you take a minute to learn about it and what's happening and you actually research the group that was coming here you would like see that but people completely missed that point and i remember having a conversation with a white cis gay friend of mine and i asked him what his relationship was to having white privilege and to having male privilege and sort of what that looked like for him and 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 what his relationship was oppression and all he could think about and all he could speak to was like the oppression he's experienced as a gay kid growing up like he, the the whole idea of like racism and classism and all the other stuff was completely lost on him and that's sort of how i feel conversations go with this mainstream gay movement like I've been really struggling with this I was telling you in the car on the way over here coming out gay for me most of my friends were 
were gay men and like that's where I where I really found community and more so and more so like I just feel like we're not even talking like we're not even reading the same book we're not even on the same planet and that leads me to another question I kind of want to like switch the order up a little bit that you something you said at the Elliott Bay reading which really resonated with me and it was around community and we wanted to ask you a question around how capitalism hurts queers and maybe this will sort of dovetail with that question just that this whole sense that we have to have this community and i think i feel this a lot too like the lgbt we're all supposed to be q we're all supposed to be in this sort of sense of community together and you said some really powerful stuff that just sort of like i felt like i had completely let go of like this 30 pound weight i've been carrying around on my shoulders when i left your reading that day because i was that's totally true she's totally right what fucking community and i'll, I'll leave it at that because i want you to speak to it so our listeners can hear yeah exactly kind of that. <laughs> totally that well i think for me i mean one thing that's been interesting you know being on uh recently on tour for why are faggots so afraid of faggots and it actually came up a few times like in the audience where people would ask I mean, the actual, the phrasing they actually used, and this was most striking actually at Elliott Bay because three different people basically asked the same question right in a row. And even after I'd answered it the first time, the next person asked it again and the third person, I mean, in slightly different ways. Uh -huh. But, you know, and the phrasing actually in Portland, someone asked the, the same exact. So the question of like, they were asking, like they phrased it as bridge building. That was the sort of phrase. Yes. So they're like, well, what about bridge building with sort of mainstream... In Portland, they literally asked, what about bridge building with HRC, you know, the human rights campaign. <laughs> and in Seattle, it was, you know, bridge building, you know, with sort of mainstream, you know, LGBT organizations. And I think, well, first of all, like just to go with the HRC, there's no bridge to build. HRC, it stands, last time I checked, you know, it's like homogenous ruling class, helping right-wingers cope. You know, the HRC is an organization that every year gives awards to companies, literally right after the BP oil spill, they gave BP a 100% rating in their LGBT friendly businesses. And so to me, that's like the absolute limitation of narrow identity politics right there. It's like, they're like, oh, maybe BP has domestic partner, you know, registry or something, or they, they give healthcare to LGBT partners or something, whatever, whatever they've decided. But they're making people homeless and killing all these animals. I mean, they're just destroying the entire world. You know what I mean? So it's like, Every year, it's like BP, Chevron, what Morgan Stanley. It's like the exact, it's like what you would make up and say as a joke. They do worse. Like I would never actually think an organization would give 100% rating to these, the worst companies in the world. Anyone knows that. You walk down the street, you're like, oh, we just, are we thinking of giving an award to BP? What do you think? Like, I guarantee that no one's going to say, I mean, unless the award is for decimation, you know, corporate profiteering and environmental degradation. Similarly, the, the kind of question, it was interesting because I think there's a bit of a discomfort among because i think actually these people who are asking me the question because sometimes i get that kind of i get people who are very clearly you know very gay marriage proponents might come to an event and they actually are sometimes very easy to spot because they'll stand in the back holding hands and looking very intent <laughs> and then they'll have a question about you know marriage right with those people i see where it's coming from because they really believe in it but i actually sensed on this tour that sometimes queer people who i think probably basically agree with what i'm saying actually are really hesitant to voice it. And when they hear, oh, well, actually, no, we don't. When I mean, if the gay, if the mainstream, you know, quote LGBT, and I mean, Q, they never even put on there, only once in a while. But like, if that agenda is about marriage and military, then no, there's actually, there is no commonality. And then like I was saying earlier, if the only way they can deal with anti-queer violence is to talk about hate crimes legislation, there is nothing. And I think for me, the real question is who benefits? When people say, well, what about bridge building? And so we're talking about a radical queer politic. Let's say that 1% of, of the visibility and the media resources, and I, I don't even know if 1% would be a radical queer politic. So people are like, oh my God, there's 1%. Well, how do we build a bridge? <laughs> it's like a bridge. What do you mean? I mean, they're the ones that need to, if there's a bridge to build, they have the power, the resources, whether it be in straight or gay media, whether it be financial, whether it be educational, whether it be the resources of mm -hmm. movement, supposedly movement resources. I mean, they have, and so to say, well, what about bridge building? Basically is saying, what about just giving up 
and giving in. Like I was saying before, it's like we have to actually talk about the structural violence and who's doing it. We need to hold mainstream gay people accountable for the violence they're enacting. Straight people are not going to do that into the world. I mean, straight people are too busy either camouflaging their own homophobia or too uncomfortable saying anything critical because they're worried that someone's going to call them homophobic to actually say, well, actually, you know, gay gentrification, urban removal, gays in the military, gay marriage, these should not be central preoccupations of a mainstream gay movement. And in the, in the sense of gentrification and consumerism, they become the sort of invisible visible, where it's like the assumed norm that is never questioned. Marriage is, and now is in that realm, where it's like any gay person is supposed to want marriage. And I, I actually really, and people say, there's this narrative, I think people want to articulate this progress narrative, you know, that it's like so much better for queer youth to grow up now, time. right? And yeah. I'm just thinking, I mean, I just thinking about growing up and being like 15 and you look out and you're like, well, what does it mean to be gay? And they're like, get married, have kids, <laughs> live in the suburbs, join the military. To me, that's worse <laughs> than looking out and seeing nothing except maybe dying of AIDS or being brutalized uh, or made invisible or killed. I mean, those are different options, but they're not options. So for me, actually, I really believe in furthering the divide. You know, we have to articulate the things that actually matter. If that causes more divisions, bring it on. There is such a stranglehold on popular representations of what it means to be queer. You know, or I'm using the word queer in this case, like in the in the broad sense, you know, not literally queer in a gender non-normative, like challenging, transformative way, but queer in the context of all these different identities, sometimes called gay or lesbian or bisexual or, or trans. Or The narrow media representations are so, it's tragic to say, you know, to ask this kind of question, like, I think, so for me, an actual bridge, if we really want to talk a bridge, because I mean, I don't believe in that that's not the concept I would use, but actually, what do we need to do? We need to talk about people's basic needs. So we need to talk about housing and healthcare and, you know, the right to stay in this country or leave if you want to, you know, having a sex, a sex life that matters, gender, self-determination, you know, sexual possibilities, all of it. Those are basic needs. That's what we need to get back to. The mainstream gay movement is obsessed with this idea of the center, right? Mm -hmm. And so the center to them always means straight, white, Christian, so-called middle America. And so that's what everything is directed towards. Everything is directed towards this the thing that's supposedly what you aren't, then I, everything is lost. It's not that something is lost, everything is lost. If instead of talking to this imagined center that it exists less and less, instead of seeing, you know, extremely affluent, you know, white gay people in $80,000 wedding gowns and modeling $50,000 wedding rings, let's say the Druid Hills Golf Club, you know, in, in Florida, I don't know if you remember that, oh, not Florida, Georgia, where, you know, these two lesbians, they wanted to join this golf club, is $50,000 each. And because they were lesbians, they had to pay twice. But if they were married, they would only have to pay $50,000 once. Oh my God. So it's like, you know, and then the, <laughs> the, the mainstream gay movement, then they get upset because Christian Wright is saying, well, it's about special rights. Well, guess what? A $50,000 golf membership <laughs> is a special right. So to me, it's like if instead of seeing this sort of like affluent, we're just like you message over and over, because actually, guess what? Again, Christian Wright, they already know we're not like them. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a Brooks Brothers suit and if you're like smoking a cigar and beating your kids, they still think you're going to burn in hell. It's not really going to help that you have a Rottweiler instead of a poodle. You know what I mean? It's really not going to help. So not only do we need to be talking about people who don't have access, but we also need to be putting those people at the center. So instead of having white affluent couples saying like, we just want what you want. If we had a transgender teenager who was, oh, well, I ran away from home because my parents were beating me up and I went to school and the teacher told me I was evil. And then, you know, now I'm on the streets, you know, I'm addicted to Crystal and I'm trying to get by. I actually think that a lot more people, including people in straight white Christian America, in quotation marks, 
would actually relate. They'd be like, oh, I actually, my parents beat me, you know? I ran away from home and I understand that's hard to like live on the streets by yourself when you're 13 years old and everyone tells you you're evil and you're gonna die and you deserve right. to burn in hell. Even if they're like, oh yeah, they do deserve to burn in hell, you know, kick them to the curb, like beat them up. At least there's a little more honesty there, you know what I mean? It's like, not only is it a dead end, that argument between Christian fundamentalists and gay assimilationists, but it also silences and a real conversation between queers, you know? So to me, that's a bridge building. If if they wanna make resources available to have a conversation between queers about like, should marriage be the central issue? Why is the military, you know, considered like valorized when it's the most, if there has to be, if there's one institution in the world responsible for more violence, it's probably that one, you know what I mean? Like the prison system. <laughs> exactly, and it's, like to me, that's what we need to talk about. Basic needs, we need to talk about putting people on the margins in the center, you know, not about centralizing white Christian homophobes. And then not only that, but telling them that, well, guess what? We just want to be like you. So what do they want? They think queers deserve to burn in hell. I guess, oh, yeah. we do too. Yeah, get rid of those fucking queers. You know, get rid of those <laughs> leathermen, get rid of those trannies, get rid of those hookers, get rid of those queer youth who are addicted to drugs, you know, get rid of those old gay men, you know, who are dying of AIDS anyway, you know, get rid of the, anyone who's not desirable. It's like, well, guess what? The whole world is already doing that work. So we don't need more people mm. to be doing that work. Our work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> I just actually wanted to yeah, like, after that long, like so much good information. But I remember at the, um, the book reading, you talked about, I think you were on Democracy Now! Is that right? And even looking at like the liberal commentary uh, in the media that we usually that champion things like let's not have war at all, but then we'll rally in the the under the guise of like well we want to be progressive and gay rights is pro progressive, but if the mainstream gay folks are asking for marriage and military don't ask don't tell removal, it's like well how did they even when they show up to give us airtime then they're having to contradict their own beliefs, which is we shouldn't be going to war. War should be gone anyways. And here we are supporting. But if you want to be in the war, be, you know, like. Yeah, it's it, like what you said about they're struggling with their own, like, homophobia. They can't right? get yeah, like, you, to I feel like at least there's no way to get it right in that way. If you have any kind of extreme politic, whether you're for or against, you know, the gay equality and there's nowhere for you to go in the, in that sense. You I do think it, you know, it's a tragedy the way the sort of straight left has embraced these basically reactionary, you know, agendas like, you know, gays in the military. And I think Democracy Now! is a perfect example. You know, the whole show is based on an anti-war platform. And so to, to their credit, they invited me on the show after I wrote a piece asking why is Lieutenant Jen Choi allowed on the show over and over again on an anti-war show, you know, and never even questioned, oh, well, are you against the war? I mean, that's not even a question. And I think the root of that is really straight homophobia, you know, and it's like, I think the straight left has not done a much better job than the straight right. I mean, they're not as vocal, about their homophobia <laughs> but so now that you know these gay mainstream issues are in the news you know the straight left is like oh well, we better do something and then they end up they'll invite like hrc on the show or like it, that's that's the sort of level that the sort of gay establishment has reached where they have the power and the resources even in totally you know in media places that make no sense. It makes no sense to like be articulating like, well, we deserve the right to fight and not be questioned on any level at all on these programs, like over, it's not like once, it's like over and over and over and over and over again. And to me, that that's a real example of the ways in which the gay establishment has been very successful at building wealthy gay lobbying clout, you know? And I think that's, Machine. that's the sort of, yeah, exactly. That's sort of the ultimate example of that. Yeah. So moving away from some of the <laughs> some of the um, larger conversations we've had about politics and kind of where we're, we're headed, you wrote a book that we actually, have, like Jesse had said earlier, we referenced a few times on some of our early episodes called Nobody Passes. So we were basically wondering kind of what your relationship is to passing and how you've navigated that in different spaces. Actually, I can even tell a story specifically about Nobody Passes, which was published, you know, it's an anthology I edited and it was published by Seal Press. And it's actually the only book I, I uh, edited where the publisher actually approached me. The publisher approached me after reading an interview I did with Bitch Magazine. 
And she was like, oh, what are you working on, blah, blah, blah. And I had a few different things at that point that I was thinking I might work on, but I knew that that book would be the one that would be the closest to what they might publish. But CL Press, you know, they have the tagline, books by women for women, you know, and they started as a feminist press. They've really moved away. They're not, I would not call them a feminist press. They really are books by women for women. And I think they were having a trans moment, you know, in a certain sense, <laughs> um, you know, because just before my book was uh, Max Valerio's trans memoir and just after it was Julia Serrano's mm -hmm whipping girl, but they weren't changing their tagline. You know, it's still books by women for women. So both the three of us are all under that tagline. I, you know, described the book, I sent in a proposal and then, you know, they wanted to know, well, what's, you know, what's your agenda? What's your gender identity? And, <laughs> and actually I think they would have been perfectly happy if I just said, I'm a woman that, I mean, I'm doing a book called Nobody Passes and, you know, I wasn't interested in passing as anything necessarily, you know, because that's the whole point of the book is what possibilities can we create if no one's required to pass as anything, you know? And if it isn't just about belonging, it's like, well, what hierarchies are we always creating? Whatever we're belonging as, you know, we're belonging as not belonging. We're, you know, I wanted to sort of expose, you know, the sort of hierarchies that we're always developing. And ironically, in, in the course of, we had many conversations, you know, but it was a lot of it was about doing this book called Nobody Passes, you know, it was like asking me to pass as these various things. It's interesting. I mean, on many levels, there's a lot of ways in which passing in my life is sort of something is imposed on me in totally different ways. It's gone in very different directions. Because actually, my first two anthologies, Tricks and Treats and Dangerous Families, the publisher actually really wanted the books to be all male. So it was actually the opposite. And with Steel Press, they kept circling back to like, well, why does this person belong in here? You know? <laughs> they actually, anyone queer, they're like, they were like, whatever, that's fine to them. But anything else, if it wasn't like a quote woman or actually even about gender in particular, that was the key. If it wasn't about, cause that's why they thought anything queer, they're like, oh, it's about gender. They were like aware on some level of certain things, but only in a certain way. So if it was about immigration mm -hmm. or about racial profiling or about anti-Arab hysteria, they, even though those are like the dominant issues about passing in the media, they were like, oh, I don't know. Mm, I don't, I'm not sure about this one. Mm. <laughs> this one's really well written, but I, mm, not, not, not sure. For me, you know, the whole point is like having an intersectional analysis, you know, mm -hmm. connecting everything. It's like, what's the point if we're just going to talk about one thing? It might as well just go to sleep and take right. a nap for a long time. You know what I mean? Be. With uh, Tricks and Treats and, and Dangerous Families, so Tricks and Treats was, you know, sex workers writing about their clients and Dangerous Families was queer survivors of, you know, sexual, emotional, physical abuse. In those cases, I understood that there could be a value in, in a, a book about male survivors or a book about um, male sex workers, because actually male survivors and male sex workers are underrepresented. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the book that I wanted to do. You know, I think too many people's lives are destroyed by gender segregation. I'm not interested in contributing to that. In my work, I always want to go beyond segregation, really, you know, in a certain binary. sense. And I think, yeah, and that's kind of binary thinking, absolutely. With Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots, I've had a lot of really interesting ways in which people are either, well, first of all, they're, even though the title of the book is Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots, it's hard for them to use the word faggot. Say like, you know, an article or something, right? And so they want to describe me, but they don't know what, they're like, oh, well, I know she's not gay, so I can't say, gay or you know so i could use trans you know which but then they only use trans so for example sometimes so then it sort of doesn't they don't also say well a faggot person doing this fact you know this I remember book, the interview you did uh, was it npr and she had a hard time like saying the title of the book right right, right, right <laughs> definitely yeah like like i think a lot of people they have yeah. a hard time you know that's okay in a certain <laughs> sense for like straight people to be uncomfortable using the word faggot but these are actually in these cases these are you know these are queer people who are they're like prioritizing one part of identity over a more fuller picture, which in this case is very relevant because the book is about faggots. Why am I doing this book? Because I'm a faggot. Not that, you know, a transgender woman might have a lot wonderful book to write, and but that's not my particular identity. I am on the trans feminine spectrum. And I think that's partially, I think, to do with the ways in which even trans identities have become more binary, you know, woman or man. It's can you be a gender queer faggot or what is that? Or even a male socialized. I think in the world, you know, there's a lot more gender queer is a word that's actually basically 
for the most part associated with like trans masculine, you know, people and as coming from that culture in particular. So it's interesting, like these ways in which passing or even just identity in particular, where the ways in which people want to, what about multiple identities? To me, the point of, you know, the original point of transgender, even as a vocabulary was here's the spectrum, here's all this stuff that people are doing and let's talk about it all, right? You know, it's not, let's have one or the other. So it's not about adding the T to LGBT. Right. That's just having another limited thing mm -hmm. that, you know, you're supposed to be another hierarchy, you know, and another demographic or something. And it's, to me, the, the possibility of a trans analysis, you know, is to rigorously take apart everything. And that starts with gender, but it has to go, you know, everywhere. Passing I, in my life, you know, it plays out in so many different ways. I think another place, I think now, you know, a lot of my books are taught at universities. And so there's this sort of, like I got an email the other day. Someone was like, there's a rumor that, you know, you've been offered a job or you're coming next year to teach queer studies at Amherst College or something. And I was like, is that rumor true? Or they asked, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't even have a college degree. Yes, if Amherst College wants to teach queer studies, and yes, I you know I have seven books you know that are in that realm, and so perhaps in reality, there's no way in hell they're ever going to invite me, you know, or any institution like that, you know, because that's not where those institutions work. Those institutions are about a certain kind of you know power and privilege, and especially educational attainment, yeah. that is based the most hierarchical. I mean, nothing can be more hierarchical than academia right. and based in very narrow notion of attainment. So another realm that sometimes I pass like as an academic, you know, in a certain sense. One of the things with Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots, I think that I spoke to a little bit at the beginning, but which is very much about past or wanting to challenge the sort of, for me, the real potential that I see, you know, in, in especially in the, the conversations and ideals of like radical queer and trans and gender queer and gender non-conforming sort of cultures, like this real like analysis, like around accountability and around negotiation and mutuality and creating desire and love and intimacy, like on our own terms. Exactly, like self-determination and chosen family and all of that doesn't exist in gay male cultures for the most part. And I think, especially in the sexual realm, most of my sex life has taken place in public sex environments, beaches and parks and, you know, sex clubs and alleys and back rooms. And those places are so rigidly policed, you know, based on gender presentation, more or less, you know. And so in those cases, like if I go to a sex club, I mean, or anyone really, a gay male sex club, in order to be seen as an item that's worthy of attention, or value. sexual value, yeah. then masculinity is the, is the currency. It's the only currency, you know. That to me is a real tragedy that in order to be in those spaces that I think could be real potential spaces for and can and sometimes are, but so much more now are like regimented rather than, you know, exploratory, you know, and are policed rather than fluid and are about conforming to stereotypical norms of masculinity rather than about creating something else. That's where I see the sort of dead end of gay masculinity, you know, where that really hits up in my like sort of intimate sort of sexual life. You know, I'm like, what am I doing in these spaces that I abhor because there's something there that I desire and that I'm looking for, but that will never recognize me. They might recognize my facial features or something or something they're projecting onto me. Like actually I often will get like a sort of, you know, like I'm Jewish, but I'll get this very, you know, they think of me as being very wasp, but you know, just this narrow kind of like vision. And, and that's what becomes attractive, even like, Innocence is often very, because like there are two things you could be, you could be like the, the strong, aggressive, dominant man, or you can be the innocent young boy. Mm -hmm. And so 38 now, when I first started going to these spaces, I was 19. So <laughs> they wanted to project. <laughs> I, I did not feel innocent, I guarantee, but they wanted to project that. And maybe it made a little sense, but now, <laughs> you know, but they still, it's still like sort of projected on. In some ways that's where the book emerged is from finding myself in these spaces that I abhor and wanting to ask the question like how do we create something else but also how do we bring the things that actually mean something to me from queer cultures like it's not coming from somewhere totally like on the other space side of the world it could be the same neighborhood in the case of seattle it's yeah. like that's one interesting thing about seattle in a certain sense which is not so true in, in other places but the gay 
and queer neighborhood, for example, is the same, you know, and, and the sort of straight hipster, yeah, like yeah. it's all the one neighborhood. And in some places that doesn't, that isn't the case anymore. I was just thinking how, when you're talking about gay men's culture, like we see that a lot in trans culture, like just how masculinity is privileged. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so even within like trans spaces, how we did an interview with Toby Hill Meyer not too long ago and just her, and I think it resonated more he hearing her talk, but I've definitely seen it happen how sort of trans men have sort of get the biggest chunk of like trans spaces. It's interesting, like most of my exposure and most, like we have a gender center here, Ingersoll, and like that's more trans women run, mm -hmm. but it's just interesting to hear her take on it and how we do really, like even with gender queer, how it's more like people assign female at birth mm -hmm. that are more sort of trans masculine that sort of take that gender queer space. And then I just think about like all the sexism and misogyny and all the internalized like crap that is going on for people. The last question that we wanted to ask you about. So we know that you lived in San Francisco for a long time and then you also lived right before you moved here to Seattle, which you just moved here about a month, month yeah. and a half ago. Welcome to Seattle. Thank you. You lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So one thing we also try to kind of think about and talk about on the podcast is just how things are in Seattle and then try to think and be mindful of our listeners across the whole country and in other countries. And so just a sense of sort of what you've experienced in relationship to all the topics that we talked today, whatever you feel like kind of calling out. And you said a little bit already, but kind of thinking about that, just to thinking about the different places that you've lived. You know, my next book is called The End of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And it's about my sort of political, cultural, emotional, social, and sexual formations and their undoing. Mm -hmm. San Francisco for me has been my most formative place. You know, I moved there when I was 19. It's where I really found my visions of what it means to be radical and queer, you know what it means to sort of create my own culture, what it means to create, you know, like challenges to the status quo, what it means to love and live with and lust for, you know, like other queers and take care of one another, not based on straight or gay norms, you know. But it's also the place for me that's let me down the most, you know, and perhaps because I kept believing in the sort of radical queer San Francisco, which I no longer believe. I don't believe in it because Unfortunately, I think so often radical queer visions become a sort of camouflage in similar ways to a mainstream gay identity, you know, the sort of rainbow flag. It's like, just put a rainbow flag over anything and then we can just beat you up and push you to the sides and, you know, call that community. And I think, I think radical queer cultures do a very similar thing. It's a more sophisticated analysis. You know, okay. people talk about accountability and talk about the violence of assimilation and people talk about, you know, treating one another, you know, with care about chosen family, and then really discard one each, one another just the same. That's where it really let me down in that way. And so I think San Francisco, in a way, offers certain kinds of possibilities for queerness that don't exist in such a visible way anywhere else that I've lived. Even if that's disappearing, you know, in a certain, you know, really saw a dramatic transformation in, you know, 2004, starting with the sort of gay marriage. Mm -hmm. San Francisco has been known for generations as a place for you know, people on the fringe right. to like come together and create all sorts of wacky and weird and messy and transformative and crazy ways of living with one another, you know? So in that sense, I think San Francisco offers a real potential, but the potential is not actualized, you know? And I, I mean, there's no question that the, the, it has the widest variety of, you know, possibilities for, especially in a public sense. Because everywhere there's, you know, queer freaks and trannies and, you know, people on the margins and doing wacky things. But like in San Francisco, it's like you can actually see them. Mm -hmm. You can actually be like, oh, here's a neighborhood mm -hmm. where there, you know, are these people and I there's can more. like figure it out. I think Seattle's really interesting. I think the first time I came to Seattle, the thing I was most impressed by, and that was in 94, the thing I was most impressed by was the culture of queer youth, which does not exist actually in San Francisco in the same way. Youth, like, you know, 14, 15, 16, mm -hmm. uh, like San Francisco has no, couldn't care less about mm -hmm. queer kids, you know, and I think that's very indicative of what happens when gay people develop, become part of the power structure. It's like, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, there's a few institutions, but just like anywhere, you know, just social service agencies, the two 
very little. The first time I came to Seattle in 1994, I remember seeing 14 year old drag queens, queer kids, like, you know, living with one another. And I think part of that is because Seattle has a youth culture, period. You mm-hmm. know, like then, especially, you know, there were cafes that were open till 4 a.m. People would go to cafes like they would go to clubs. They get dressed up. You know, anyone could go. There wasn't like, you know, carding. So that's one thing that I've always seen in Seattle, but especially then, actually, that was that really struck me. Being here now, you know, I've only been here a little over a month, so I can't make too many generalizations. <laughs> but it is interesting. One, another thing actually that's tricky for me, I think, you know, I think every city and even some smaller towns has some cultures of like queer, you know, non-normative, radical thinking queers. But in those cultures, there are very few male socialized fags. Like, very few. The only real exception is San Francisco. It's still a vast minority, and that's because gay men do not politicize anything, unfortunately. (laughs) That's the way, you know, dominant gay culture has become, you know. And I think dominant lesbian culture is now mimicking that and trying to be that. But it still has a long way to go to reach the horrible... (laughs) (laughs) you know, realm of mainstream gay culture. I mean, so moving to Santa Fe, for example, Santa Fe is a small town, so there's 70,000 people. So it's hard to compare in a certain sense, but you know, Santa Fe is very spread out. Everyone drives everywhere. Queer Santa Fe really reflects that. It's privatized, so it takes place at people's houses. Mm -hmm. There is a little culture of, you know, queer women and transmasculine people. It's like very segregated in a certain sense. You know, it exists. It's, well, it's super clicky, <laughs> but it's like, it's only, it doesn't intersect with anything else. That's what it is. I mean, a little bit like, say with like circus culture, you know, or, but mostly not. For me in Santa Fe, that would be the world that I sort of would gravitate towards. But literally in that world, there were basically no fags, you know, maybe once in a while you might see one. And that, usually it was when I was looking in the mirror. You know, there were a few people, trans people, you know, who are fags but not existing outside of the sort of queer women and uh, transmasculine kind of culture. And I'm saying and transmasculine, but in Santa Fe, the transmasculine part is very small, you know? Mm. It's not like in, in Seattle or in San Francisco. For me, the real tragedy of Santa Fe though was how apolitical that queer world was. It was really not politicized on anything except gender a bit and social, having a world that was a little bit separate. It was a little bit politicized about that, but not about any broader issue. Were they feminists? I don't, I, <laughs> it's hard to say, it's hard oh. to say. Oh, you mean like an old school feminist? Any, any or kind. even feminist identified? Yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I would say probably not. There was definitely an, a more old school lesbian world, for sure. Okay. And then there's a lot of like retired gay people but they also exist in their own sort of world. I really felt like Santa Fe is a city with a lot of gay people and no gay culture, no queer culture, and a a certain amount of queers and and no queer culture, really. And I mean, other than at people's houses, pretty much. And actually it's it's not a homophobic place, you know, in in the standard sense. The rhetoric of Santa Fe is all about, they call it like the city different, you know, (laughs) anyone can be anything. But basically what it means is most of the gay people are closeted, you know, it's it's kind of ironic. Gay people are Accepted and closeted. <laughs> so those would be some of the things. It's tricky, I think. Everywhere you have to find what is going to mean something to you. I think in Santa Fe, for me, it was probably the hardest in a certain sense. Yeah. There were like a couple people who I could really relate to, and that was all. And there were not going, and there was no possibility really that I would ever have a sex life with someone who I could actually have a conversation, like a meaningful, deep conversation. I struggle with that with. here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's tricky, actually. And uh, Seattle's an interesting, an interesting one. I think it, talking about, I remember when I lived in Seattle, you know, I lived here in 96, 97 for a little over a year. And gay Seattle, gay male Seattle in particular, was not that different from gay Boston. You know, I lived in gay Boston, and Boston is like the most clicky, the most stereotypical, like New England preppy, these vicious bags who are like, but vicious about the stupidest things. Like, you know, it's super bitchy, but not about anything, you know, be bitchy like, you know, just like gross, it's like misogynist, fat phobic, just like gross things. So we're just like, that's just the norm. And gay male Seattle is not that different from gay Boston, <laughs> which is ironic because straight male Seattle, you know, has, there's a very more, sub, under- but at least something subcultural. Like pseudo. <laughs> like pseudo, yeah, like a little bit like, you know, more, uh, a little more, 
A little more gender fluid, perhaps. Well, now. Skating. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we but anyway, so. About skinny jeans. Oh, skinny jeans. Did you have a whole program on them? <laughs> Not I really. Had a life program. <laughs> Coming from California in general, trying to fit in a little bit better here and being like, I don't do skinny jeans. We had a whole. Yeah. Jesse took me to the store. To try skinny jeans. It was like a phase. And I was like, Blake, I just can't get with it. <laughs> There's a whole backstory. Okay. <laughs> well, next week on Gender Cast, the program will be about skinny jeans. <laughs> which which brands do you prefer? Oh do you like Lycra or what are the other? What are the I other ass huggers or a little bit of like a baggy? <laughs> oh my god, that's gonna be one of our most popular shows here. In the do you, do you want the ones that stretch with you or just like regular jean material? Like did denim? skinny jeans <laughs> make you gay <laughs> or did being gay make you wear skinny jeans? Next that week. is definitely the very, very, very most important question. <laughs> <laughs> what is my life coming to? <laughs> Oh, um, Matilda, thank you so much for doing this episode with us. As we wrap up, I guess I just, you mentioned something about a, a, your next project, and we usually ask people to talk about if they have anything going on or projects or websites you want people to check out. We'll definitely post links to your blog and to your main website. But if there's anything else you want to shout out to people to check out. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, you can always keep up with me, yeah, on my on my homepage, which is just my name.com, Matilda Bernstein, Sycamore.com. And yeah, my next book, it'll be coming out um, next April, the end of San Francisco. It's going to be a real tearjerker, I think. Oh, so. That makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> I call it part oh. memoir, part social history, and part elegy. It'll be a heartbreaker. It broke my heart, I know. So I hope it breaks other people's hearts, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I had a great time listening to you read as well as um, have this discussion. I, if you see Matilda walking down the street in Seattle, say hello. Oh yeah, please say hello. <laughs> please say hello. And say hi, Matilda, so I don't just think you're, you know, it's just a random person. <laughs> I mean, I like, although I like random people, I will say people in Seattle are not as friendly as I am. No, They're Seattle not please. as friendly because I, I I say a lot of people on the street and people are like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what to do. It's like, oh my God, oh my God. Is she cruising me? Uh, there you have it, Seattle. Does she want to get married? Did, did she bring diamonds? <laughs> All right, well, that wraps up episode 26. And until next time, we'll see you guys later. Copyright 2012 Gendercast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of Gendercast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact Gendercast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me, cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Accept the different and find the peace of mind make us who we are what we know some of us are scared to let it show let it out scream this is me now it's time that the whole world see i am not the only one born under this golden Beneath the 
surface you will find a million thoughts that cross my mind a million paths that can unwind